Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Mark Dan, Director of Governmental Affairs at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. This week, we're talking about a dangerous plan that's in the works to restore impoundment, which gives the President of the United States the ability to reject funds appropriated and approved by Congress. Joining me in studio is FFRF's legal fellow and in-house expert on impoundment, Hirsch Joshi. Hi, I'm glad to be back. All right. And also joining us today on the panel is Daniel Schumann, the executive director of the American Governance Institute. He's an expert on good government policies in the legislative branch of the United States. And he wrote an article in the American Prospect about the th threat of the impoundment process and Project 2025. So welcome, Daniel. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, so the concept of impoundment was brought up recently on last week tonight with John Oliver. We're going to play a clip of that episode where John I'll, where John talks about uh, impoundment and how it can be used if Project 2025 is sent to promotion. So, Bruce? A lot of them derive from the so-called unitary executive theory, which was developed during the Reagan years. Its supporters argue that Article 2 of the Constitution gives the president complete control of the executive branch. As one person who's read that manifesto puts it, it turns the separation of powers among the three branches into a game of rock, paper, scissors, except rock beats everything. Here is one example. There used to be a thing called impoundment, where a president could stop or redirect money that Congress had already appropriated for something. Congress actually made that illegal in 1974 after some abuses during the Nixon administration. It, it may ring a bell for you because it came up during Trump's first impeachment hearings when he held up aid to Ukraine to try and get them to look for dirt on the Biden family. So, so Daniel, what did John get right and what did he leave out about impoundment and Project 2025? Well, what he got right is that impoundment is an incredibly dangerous tool. And uh, he also got right the concept of unitary executive theory. Although it doesn't go back you know, just to the early 80s, it goes back thousands of years to the idea of kings, right? Impoundment is the ability to make a determination about what, uh, when, when Congress appropriates money, whether uh, it will be spent for the purpose for which, for which it's intended. And when you look back um, uh, to the Magna Carta, right, this was the fight that took place uh, 700 years ago, 800 years ago, with respect to having a legislature that can hold a sovereign uh, um, accountable. And the reason that impoundment matters so much is when Congress goes through this process and it bargains and negotiates with other members of Congress and with the executive branch about what they're, what they're going to spend the money on. The idea that after it goes through the process and the president signs the bill and it becomes a law, that he can just go, nah, I'm not going to spend money on that anyway, it, it destroys the entire negotiating and bargaining and conciliation process, which is what makes a democracy function. So impoundment is very dangerous. The power to tax, the power to spend, is the power to control. If Congress doesn't have that power, then Congress is not in power. And so where I get confused is, it's in the Constitution that appropriations will happen. Um, doesn't this just turn that on its head or negate it or get around it? Yeah. So, I mean, there have been, at times, you know, the, the president has... Uh, you know, unless Congress has acted, has had the ability to, to hold back funds. So you can imagine a scenario where you need to go and, and buy an aircraft carrier and in some strange universe, it actually costs less than, than you thought, right? And mm -hmm. what happens with the money that's available there? Um, that money's not gonna be spent because that would, that would not make any sense. But that's different from uh, the idea that um, Congress says you need to go and spend $10 million in school lunches and, you're, and the president's like, nope, I'm only gonna spend $2 million on school lunches, or I'm going to spend the money on it, but only if you, locality, if you state, decide to do something that I like. So, like, this changes the center of where the debate's happening from inside the legislative branch, which is designed for this, right, mm -hmm. to the executive branch, which was never intended to play this role. So if the president and their administration do adopt Project 2025 and start using this impoundment power, uh, what are they likely to attack first to dismantle the separation of church and state, just to bring it back to FFRF stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it could be anything. It could be everything from uh, uh, matters of um, how, how your kids go to school. So uh, are you going to, um, uh, you know, tell school libraries that they can't have certain books? Um, that, that teach science, for example, 
um, and let, you know, um, that they must also have books around creationism. You could imagine it uh, with respect to travel to and from school with busing and what's subsidized and what's not. You could imagine it in the context of abortion rights. Um, the idea sort of underlying um, Project 2025 and in, in, in what this looks like is sort of Christian nationalism, which is a particular view of what families look like. So if you have a family that does not conform to uh, the way that the, the administration in Trump 2025 would think of what your family is, they will make efforts to uh, not support it, whether it's, you know, if, if um, uh, you have different religious beliefs or if um, you're a protected class or if it's not two parents and two kids and a dog and a cat and what, you know, like it's, it's they can do almost anything, right? They can throw the kitchen sink at this issue um, where everything that you can imagine that affects your life uh, will be open to question uh, because empowerment is the ability to um, really affect the decisions made at the federal level and those that uh, are funded through the federal government at the state and local levels as well. And to that point that you're talking about, sometimes very basic commonplace laws that you sometimes even forget might exist, like IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, um, which allow kids to have the right to an IEP, uh, should they need one, or even MTALA, as uh, the Supreme Court sort of heard uh, this last term. No, I, I think that I think that's right. I mean, you, there is really no facet of your life that is not touched by decisions made by the federal government, and um, whether you know Project Twenty Twenty Five talks about the abolition of the Department of Education and the use of funds that are appropriated through the, um, you know, for educational purposes to go and affect your schools. You can, you can really just imagine, um, think, so one of the interesting things about the way the federal government works is that things don't need to be conceptually connected. So the reason that we have um, speed limits uh, on the highways has to do with the way federal highway funds work. And the federal government would threaten, if you don't do what I want, we're not going to give you money to build your roads. So mm -hmm. the government would have the ability to connect entirely disconnected issues as a way of pushing states and localities to do things uh, that they otherwise wouldn't want to do. And their ability to fight it is fairly limited. Um, and it would take a very long time. And you can see that we have a fairly hostile judiciary. So it would be a uphill climb for anyone who's trying to push back against these types of determinations. So just, just to make sure that I'm hearing you right, so the federal government, let's say there's a tornado in Illinois, um, the federal government under this Project 2025 uh, framework could say, hey, Illinois, you protect reproductive freedom, uh, no money for you for emergencies, even if they're tornadoes. Am I getting that right? Yeah, it's very close. I mean, it, it depends on in, too much in the weeds, like the mechanism by which they choose to make those funds available. But yes, if there is a level of presidential discretion, or even in certain circumstances, if there's not, yes, you could do that. And, and we saw, um, I think it was in, in 2012 or 2013, there were a number of natural disasters. You already had some senators saying, we're not going to send disaster relief funds um, to Puerto Rico, um, to uh, New York, I think, after Hurricane Sandy, or Superstorm mm -hmm. Sandy. So there already is this sort of regional and sectional differences with respect to a willingness to do things that we all should do for one another because it's a union of states and not a union of a bunch of individuals. Um, so there already is sort of travel down this road. Uh, I can see the you know future Trump administration trying to go further down this path. Well, so it sounds like empowerment is a great tool if you want to supercharge Christian nationalism. Well, you know, um, as Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and this this is a tool that separates the president from the rest of us, right? It's we have a system of checks and balances. The concept of unitary executive, where the president gets to be the decider, is not how it works. That like it, our system is designed to prevent that. But when you take out certain key pieces, such as a uh, check and balance around spending, mm -hmm. what you get is the system sort of flops. And we are we've already gone very far in this direction, right? There are a lot of folks who want to have a very powerful president, um, and they are willing to go to do almost anything in, in that direction. If you remember during George Bush's um, so-called uh, war on terrorism, um, that the U.S. Um, justified the use of torture to the point of organ failure and death on a bunch of spurious legal theories 
And the way they went there was by sort of keeping those theories secret from the rest of us. You can imagine a supercharged Department of Justice under one of the adherents to Project 2025 coming out with a number of secret opinions that allowed the executive branch to do a wide range of things that we would not know about, or that would be in such a posture that we wouldn't be able to challenge them in court, which is sort of the other danger, is that a lot of things that the executive branch does, these are discretionary decisions, and it's very hard to prove um, a discriminatory reason behind uh, decisions that are discretionary. Um, and while empowerment itself is not something that's allowed, um, there will be a lot of things happening all at the same time, and it will be very hard to fight. Um, the administration will be able to flood the zone uh, from everything that you can imagine to a bunch of things that you probably cannot. Well, and so uh, Representative uh, Jared Huffman, the uh, co-chair of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, um, it, has been pretty instrumental in developing the Stop Project 2025 task force, and they're working to counteract efforts that undermine democratic institutions. What advice would you give them to stop uh, empowerment and Project 2025? Work faster. <laughs> uh, so if you want to deal with the problems that are coming, where are we? It's uh, middle middle of September. Um, you got three months. We've got a couple weeks now um, when Congress is in session. You The real time that you've got is December, which is post-election, pre-new administration. There's a number of must-pass bills that need to become law. Um, and if you want to bring transparency to the Office of Legal Counsel, for example, if you want to um, uh, cut the cut the you know, un undermine the ability of places to, to, to push ideas like empowerment, you can do that legislatively by preventing funding for those types of things. But, I mean, time is, time is running out. Beyond that, a lot will really depend on what the nature of the, of the next political alignment looks like. Uh, if there is a strong House and Senate and a Trump administration, then they should use their, the circumstances to be pushing um, using all the different devices and mechanisms you know, available to them uh, from, from how money is spent through appropriations to limiting the expenditures of funds to forcing other measures uh, through uh, special counsel laws, things like that, that um, would help rein in the executive branch. But you know, there is the recent decision that, that we all saw uh, mm -hmm. with respect to Chevron review. Uh, there is there's a number of other decisions as well. Like, there is a lot that they need to do and not very much time to get it into place. So I'm going to ask you a very impossible question now. Uh, do you think sure. impoundment will go before the Supreme Court? And what do you think will, they will decide? And do you think they'll just tell us all mm -hmm. the pound sand? That's a great question and a good pun. Um, so it's gone before the Supreme Court before in the 70s. And the Supreme Court said Congress's law uh, with respect to impoundment as part of the, the law that established the Congressional Budget Office uh, in, in 1974, that is constitutional. Um, we had there was litigation in the 90s around um, the line item veto, which is another version of impoundment. It's where Congress actually foolishly gave the president the authority to go through appropriations bills and strike out items, and the Supreme Court said, "No, you can't do that." But, but, what will these justices do? <sighs> Who knows? <laughs> it could be any. I mean. They are not moored to precedent. They're not moored to conventional ways that lawyers think about the law. We know that some of them are ideological. Some of them are political. Um, they could do anything, right? I, I don't, you know, will the courts be a check on this? It's really difficult to imagine that. And, and sort of making matters even worse, putting aside their um, political alignment, many of them are former executive branch senior officials, and they have an executive branch-centric view. They are the kinds of folks who think that unitary executive theory is swell. And that is dangerous. These are not people with those, There's, there are not former congressional staff serving on the Supreme Court. There are not people who think about Congress as the first branch of government sort of in that role. And these are also folks who are not specialists in the way that the legislative process is supposed to work. They don't really understand it. And they're going to be the ones who are making the call when a number of them have been appointed by the person who may very well be back in the White House. That is not a, a, that is a situation ripe for abuse.
And, and that, if I were to predict, I would, if you if you were paying me as a litigator, which you're not, um, mm -hmm. and I'm not a litigator, I would try to avoid going to the courts as much as possible, um, at least until there's some turnover, because the results will not be great. So it sounds like unitary executive theory, uh, plus the results coming out of Trump v. the United States, is just really a nice way of saying king. Is that accurate? Yes. I could give you a longer answer, but yes. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, but this is what this is. There, there. I mean, I'm, I'm being a little cute here, but like, there are a lot of people within the, within, part of our political space now, um, including an academic at Harvard who, who really, don't like this political arrangement that that we have. They want to take direction from religious leaders as to how yeah. we should order our society. Um, they talk about post-liberalism or an illiberal political structure. So while I feel like I've eaten, you know, like, like, like we're crazy to talk about people who think that things like kings or like, you know, monarchs, like that type of thing should, be, should exist, there, there are a number of folks who really want to structure things in a very different way, and they would be very happy with this. And I, and I should say, just as a, as a, as a footnote to that, um, this isn't just Republicans. There are a lot of people who go out there and say when there's a problem, well, why doesn't the president just fix it, right? Mm. Why doesn't he just, like, do an executive order, right? Or, or he can wave his hands and, like, it will fix things. And we're looking to the wrong branch and to the wrong person to do that. It's Congress that should be doing these things. And if you're unhappy with Congress, then we need to strengthen Congress and we need to fix Congress and we need to get better representatives in Congress. But every time we look to the president to solve a problem, we're digging deeper. Um, you're relying on one person, and if you've got a great person, that's great. But if you've got a lousy person, you're really in trouble. So if a new, if a new Project, 20, Pro Project 2025 administration takes office, what can FFRF or its advocacy arm, the FRF Action Fund, do uh, to prevent its implementation uh, either before they get in or um, while uh, that administration starts uh, going to work? It depends, I think, a lot on the political posture. So, so for the next couple months, go in the halls of Congress, and there's a number of good measures that exist that have been advanced by uh, smart members uh, in, in both political parties. Do everything you can to help get them into praise. There's a, a press protection bill called the Press Act, um, mm -hmm. That should be law. There's provisions with respect to the Office of Legal Counsel. The appropriations bills, which are the spending bills, um, are not law yet. There, it's possible to put things in there as well. Like, so get as many things in place now while you can. Then afterward, um, find your allies where you can. Um, if, if you've got a majority or a possible majority in the chamber, and I don't mean like, you know, it's Democrats or Republicans, like, if you can find a way to make a functional majority on these types of issues and, and find... Um, allies or strange bedfellows to push legislation to rein in the executive branch, to insist that the Senate appoint better people, uh, well, confirm better people to the courts. Um, and beyond that, I think you're gonna, you'll probably have to be active in court um, and, and looking to whatever opportunities you can to publicize the problems and to, to, to slow things down as much as possible, um, you know, You'll try to wait out the administration, and with luck, uh, the administration will turn over and will actually be willing to vacate power after four years, which maybe they will. Um, I live near D.C., right? I was here for January 6th, so maybe they will and maybe they won't. So that's, that's about all you can do. Oh, only if Mike Pence has the courage to do so. Uh, so when President Trump was first elected, his administration used impoundment regarding funding for Ukraine, uh, which led to his first impeachment, of course. Uh, what happened in that situation? Oh, well, so uh, Trump was basically blackmailing or tried to blackmail through an envoy, uh, the head of uh, the president of Ukraine, to, um, to make allegations regarding uh, Joe Biden and his, and his son. Um, which the Ukrainian leader was unwilling to do. Um, this went on for a period of time. Uh, GAO started, uh, so the Government Accountability Office on the Legislative Branch like keeps an eye on this stuff. So they, they got involved um, uh, with this as well. It ultimately became a political question 
Um, and you saw both litigation happening, but you also saw the impeachment happen. And, and um, at the time, there were more, um, the, re the Republican configuration was a little bit different. So they were you know, not providing support to Ukraine and this type of behavior was something that some of, some of the Republican leaders were not willing to countenance. Um, so you end up with some pushback there as well. Um, so like that's, that's sort of how it played out. But ultimately, of course, the Senate was unwilling to hear witnesses. Uh, Mitch McConnell prevented accountability for Trump. This, the you know, sort of in this in this process, um, and then we, you know, there was a second impeachment and all that stuff. So, like, there was an effort to act. Um, impeachment was, you know, passed in the House. It didn't succeed in the Senate, um, and that sort of left us sort of in this in betwixt in between position where we find ourselves now. So what could a future administration do to change the rules when using impoundment to make sure they aren't abused or make sure that they're not breaking the law? Uh, impeach and remove is probably a good starting point. Um, refuse to confirm people or to, or to hold them account. Uh, reviving uh, contempt powers of Congress is probably another thing that would work well. Right now, the way um, contempt works is that if, if you find someone in contempt of Congress, the person who's responsible for enforcing that is the Department of Justice, which mm. tends not to enforce contempt against its own administration. So you could find a way for uh, an independent entity to, to play that role. Uh, Congress can make better use of the appropriations process to cut off funds for things that they don't like. Um, that's probably, I mean, it'd be a fight, but, but Congress has the tools to win the fight if they're willing to make the effort. And we've seen a certain candidate try to distance himself from Project 2025, and it seems he's trying to implement its principles uh, while he'd be president. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit more about what that might look like? Well, so, I mean, Project 2025 is part of a broader effort. Um, there, you know, Russ Vogt, who's the, um, uh, the former head of the Office of Management and Budget and, prob and potentially the next chief of staff for the Trump administration, uh, who has been pushing uh, the impoundment issue. You know, he has his own separate plan as well for impoundment that is separate from uh, the Project 2025 stuff. I mean, 20, in some respects, like Project 2025 is a catch-all for like all the folks sort of in the, in the conservative sphere to throw their eyes and ideas in there, and some of them are contradictory. So you do have different factions within the Republican Party sort of fighting things out. Um, but I would expect that... Um, the Trump administration is going to learn from its first administration and have less of the, so, the like the normie Republicans, like the folks that would feel constrained by things like the rule of law, and they're going to go more for the folks that are just willing to go for it, and they'll be able to overwhelm our political system's ability to respond to these things. I suspect, um, and that and that's that's the most likely um, path will be picking your battles for the things that are really worth pushing back on. Well, uh, Daniel, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We know this is a big topic. Thank you so much for your work and writing about it and talking about it. Uh, Hirsch, also your work um, here at FFRF um, on this issue. So it's really, this is, a, this is an awful lot. And clearly Project 2025 is no joke and uh, it's gonna be an interesting couple of months. So thank you so much for your insight uh, and coming on the show this week. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And that wraps up uh, this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Our broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters, just started a new season this week. And this upcoming Sunday on the show, FFRF co-presidents Annie Lori Gaylor and Dan Barker will speak with historian Brian Rigg about the Shinto religious violence during World War II. Here's a sneak peek of that. Hirohito was thought to also be an intermediary between some of the biggest Shinto gods out there, the sun god, uh, you know, which is on their flag, to reveal revelation to the Japanese, how they were supposed to dominate the world, and why they were the chosen people. So Hirohito was also the prophet, if you will, the messenger uh, for the guidance in the spiritual you know, welfare of the people in a Shinto you know, um, uh, society that Japan was. You can watch Free Thought Matters on the FFRF YouTube channel. 
And don't miss our weekly radio show, Free Thought Radio. You can find Free Thought Radio at ffrf.org slash radio or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check out the latest episode of We Dissent, the only podcast hosted exclusively by women constitutional lawyers discussing state church separation. Listen and subscribe to We Dissent wherever you get your podcasts or check us out online at we-dissent.org. We also have a lot of fun and irreverent merch available on our online store. There's t-shirts, bumper stickers, pins, coffee mugs, books, and so much more. You can check all that out by visiting ffrf.org slash shop. Finally, if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. If you're already a member, thank you. And if not, please join us. See you next time on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.